for better days to come and carry us like wind in our sails. Hold on tight, I can smell the shore, it's right in front of us if we just hold on tight. This vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. everybody and welcome to the fourth episode of the Freya Knitz podcast um, you're all very welcome here um, this is my fourth uh, time to record a vlog about um, everything to do with knitting so that's what my podcast is about it's all about knitting I also talk a little bit about wild plants and um, ancient Celtic ancient Irish traditions and folklore associated with um, with nature and the seasons. Um, so today I'm going to talk, go dive straight into the knitting. Um, and I'm, I am going to talk a little bit about uh, one aspect of, of ancient Irish traditions and customs related to blackberries. So I'm going to talk about blackberries today, but I'm going to put that at the very end of the podcast. So you're welcome to hang on if you want and or skip to that or just listen straight to the knitting. So I just thought I'd give you a little bit of, for those who haven't seen my podcast before, a little bit of a background about me. Um, my name is Anya and I live in the west of Ireland, very near to um, a holy mountain called Croke Patrick. So uh, I am... Um, I've been living here for about 12 years uh, and I really love it here. It's a wild place. It's really, um, we get a lot of wind, we get a lot of rain. Um, we're exposed to uh, the everything that the Atlantic weather throws at us. Um, yeah, so it's a really beautiful place and I can see the Atlantic Ocean from the hill that I live on. Um, so it's, uh, I'm really in touch with nature. Uh, through living here which is which makes me very happy and um, as my Instagram uh, description puts it I just love everything wild and woolly so wool is one of my passions as uh, as you can tell from from um, my podcast so yeah so I have uh, I live with here with my son Ruben and my two cats this is Gatto uh, so he always is the one looking for attention. The uh, my other cat isn't around at all. She always she's a little female cat, and she's very shy. So she runs away whenever I'm talking to anybody. 
Anyhow, so uh, yeah, you're all really, really welcome. Welcome to returning viewers and to those who are looking at this podcast for the first time. And thank you so much to everybody who's commented and liked and subscribed. Um, I really appreciate all of the beautiful comments, all of the support. The knitting community really is absolutely incredible. Um, and I'm so delighted that this vlog has allowed me to really just make more of a connection with people and to share ideas, share inspiration for knitting. Um, yeah, so it's just, uh, it's, it's a really lovely thing to do. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope you're all well. I hope you um, have some knitting with you to, to knit with, to knit on while I'm talking. And uh, I hope you all have your beverage of choice. I have my lovely fox mug still. And today I'm actually drinking coffee. So I'm not drinking one of my herbal teas. So it's uh, the weather has changed here. It's got a little bit more autumnal it's sweater weather and uh yeah it's time for my coffee i think <laughs> okay so um yeah i hope you're all settled in and uh ready for uh some of my knitting so basically actually i should have told you where you can find me i'm on Inst instagram as freya knits and um ravelry as freya knits as well um yeah, so what am I wearing? So this is my um, one of the finished objects that I showed you in my last vlog. And actually it is a, uh, a pattern by Albina McLaughlin called the Turntable Pullover. Um, it is knit with Life in the Long Grass. Um, it, the colorway is Hillside. So as you can see, I didn't actually worry about pooling in this. I just allowed it to I didn't do any helical knitting or anything like that to prevent pooling. As you can see, it is absolutely beautiful the way the um, the color distribution is when the yarn is knit up. Uh, and I have to say, it was one of my favorite um, things to knit recently because of the interest in the changing colors and how the, the the fabric was emerging because of the the way the yarn is dyed. So it's dyed in West Cork um, and. Um, I always also love to support uh, yarns that are fairly local to me, but that doesn't mean they're the only yarns that I knit with. I actually love, um, as you'll see, yarns that come all the way across the Atlantic from the States, yarns from other parts of Europe. Um, yeah, so, um, but I do love to, uh, to knit with Life in the Long Grass. Um, so, this has some beautiful um, details on it. You can see the shoulder detail there is, um, and I'm not sure if you can really see that properly. That's probably better there. You can see the way it's a, it's almost like a contiguous sleeve um, that expands out as you as you move into the, the sleeve portion of the sweater after the yoke. Um, I had some, just a little issue when I was knitting this, um, when I, <laughs> There's a Latvian braid where the, the neck separates into or becomes starts to, to become the yoke. Um, and it was the first time that I had knit Latvian braid. So I think I had to do that twice to get it right. Um, it also took quite a long time, but uh, it's a beautiful detail. And that detail appears again on the sleeve. You can see here, uh, Latvian braid all the way where the, the rib changes from three by one to two by two, two, by two in the cuff. So this three by one rib, which is slow to knit, but really, um, I just love it. I love three by one rib. It's one of my favorite knitting pattern, knitting stitch patterns. Um, yeah, so uh, what else did I want to say about this? I made a mistake as well when I was knitting it at the beginning, I had to rip back. I had mixed up the back from the front and it's really important in this pattern because as you can see the where the shoulder seams are they're slightly to the back to allow the shoulder the, the sweater to hang properly so there's a shorter uh number of stitches a smaller number of stitches in the back to the front um and of course the um the short row shaping happens in the back of the sweater so what i had ended up doing was doing short row shaping on the longer side which would have been the front so it would have meant the front was higher than the back. 
So I had to rip back and when I realized, luckily I realized it fairly soon and I ripped back and uh, re-knit it. But that was the only issue I had. I mean, the pattern was really clear. I don't know how I messed up or mixed it up. Um, so really not the pattern's fault, not um, the designer's fault. I'll be in a McLaughlin it has very clear patterns. Uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you about the gauge, I got gauge on this, which is brilliant because often I don't, I think I get gauge much easier with, with smaller, uh, with the lighter weight wool. I find getting gauge with uh, worsted weight or iron weight much more difficult for some reason. I don't know if anybody else has that experience. Maybe you could leave it in the comments below if you, if you have that experience where different weights of wool um sometimes you get easier you get gauge more easily with a different weight of wool um anyhow i wanted to show you that i got gauge with this and this is my little swatch and you can see that it is um blocked so that there is um you know that there, there is space between the ribs between the three by one ribs um and it's tricky enough to uh, it's not tricky enough but I suppose it's something you just have to pay attention to when you're blocking it that you don't over block it or under block it and certainly the design intention here is to have a gap between the the ribs and to give an open look to the sweater and the great thing about Albina's um, her uh, the designer's um, pattern the way it's written is that she actually is really uh, helpful there's lots of advice on how to block the three by one rib to get a sweater that that fits so um yeah so the fit of this is really is really lovely i have to say the drape is gorgeous from the um from the life in the long grass which is 100 percent merino singles and um yeah it's really gorgeous um gives a really nice drape so yeah um I think that's all there is to say about this um, this particular sweater and uh, so we'll move on and talk a little bit about um, my finished objects. So I have a little list here to keep me on track. Um, no, I wasn't going to talk about the, uh, the finished objects, was I? I was going to talk about my works in progress. Okay. So the Billy Pullover, that was one of the ones I had not started. I had done a, I had started, I had cast it on the last time, um, but it was at the very beginning of the project. And uh, so I'll show you where I've got to now. So this is it. Um, I'm showing you, yeah, I'm showing you the front of it there. So it is, um, you see the detail there. Um, let's look at the All of the different stitch patterns in this sweater it's absolutely beautiful i'm really loving knitting with this wool as well so this wool is um it's all the way from the states this is the uh, linen not linen quill um it's um it is it's linen quill worsted so it's not the fingering weight version it's the it's the heavy iron weight version of um of linen quill which is 50 percent um, peruvian highland wool uh 35 alpaca and 15 percent linen so it's just a stunning wool um and it's actually working out i mean it's so lovely to knit with because of the softness of it and the warmth of it and it's actually working out to be a really nice um texture in the cable i wasn't sure whether in my last uh, podcast i was saying maybe this is going to be just a little bit too much too warm with the cables but actually it's not it's really nice it's it's soft so soft um yeah 
So the only problem with this pro project was my gate, which is completely different to Sari Nordland's. By the way, this is a uh, pattern by Sari Nordland, uh, the Billy Pullover. It's got, become very well known. A lot of people are knitting it. Um, it's a, a classic Aran um, design, but with a really modern profile or a contemporary profile, which, uh, which I love. Um, and it's knit top down. It's really the pattern is actually so clear, such a clear pattern. My goodness, um, it, there's been absolutely no difficulty at all in following it. And um, once you put your markers in for where each stitch pattern starts and where it ends, you're absolutely going to be flying with this. Well, I won't say flying because it actually takes <laughs> takes a long time. <laughs> um, I have just separated for the sleeves, uh, so I'm knitting the body. Uh, and now it's funny because I really focus on something when I've got a lot to think about in a project and after that when I get down to where I just have to keep repeating for another like 10 inches or so I sort of lose interest <laughs> so that's where I'm at anyway but I'm, I'm continuing on with it um, I will say because of the amount of concentration that's required for this I have made a few mistakes which I haven't ripped back for I reckon you know nobody's gonna see them and if they do, it's just a sign that it's a hand knit sweater. I just love the idea that nothing is perfect. So uh, I don't know if I can even find the mistakes now. I was going to show you some mistakes that I've made, but basically the mistakes happen in the uh, direction of the cables. Sometimes when I'm not concentrating, the cable goes in the wrong direction. Um, and it's a really good thing that I can't actually find any. <laughs> I can't find them now. Now that I'm actually wanting to show you, so it just shows that it's it's not such a big deal if you make if you make a mistake. Uh, as my mother always used to say, a man on a galloping horse wouldn't notice it. So that's pretty much. I mean, even me pouring over it now, I can't see where they are. So uh, cable knitting, if you've never done it before, it's actually an awful lot easier than it looks. So. This looks really complicated. It's not, it's really simple. It's just a matter of switching stitches around the order of the stitches around on your needle. Um, this is the first cable pattern that I've ever knit without using a cable needle. So I knit a whole, I knit one of the um, Thea Coleman's uh, patterns for my niece a couple of years ago. And it was the Peter's Whiskey, the cardigan. And I used a cable needle there and it was very slow and it's much quicker when you're not using a cable needle. It's, uh, it's a really, um, it's a technique that I didn't know how to, to do until I followed a few YouTube videos and uh, it's really straightforward and much, much quicker. So I'd recommend if you haven't tried it, tr uh, to try doing cables without a cable needle. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say about this? Um, no, I think that's pretty much everything. Um, yeah, so I just have to keep knitting. Uh, I love the color of this. It's um, pale oats and uh, it's a really classic. I mean, it's actually showing up quite white and bright on the screen now, but in reality, it's a really sort of woolly uh, color. It looks like it's just raw fleece from the wool or from the sheep, raw wool from the sheep. So. Um, yeah, uh, as you can see, I have I'm using these um, these sort of silicone. Um, I forgot what they're called now. Um, the Knitting Barber is is uh, is the brand anyway for these, and they're fantastic. You just stick the you stick one of these onto the end of your needle, and you pull it through the stitches that you want to uh, put on hold. So it's. Uh, they're really, really handy, a really handy thing to use. So Gotto wants to get right in here on top of me while I'm talking to you. Now, Gotto, you're going to have to just sit down behind me or something. You'll have to sit down behind me. Come here. Come here. Okay. Good boy. So, yeah, so that's my first work in progress and um, really enjoying that knit. I've been I've put it aside recently to focus a little bit more on the Trasnu pullover, which actually the Trasnu top, it was a summer top designed by, also by Albina McLaughlin, 
which I picked up at the end of August when the weather was really hot and I thought oh I might finish this in a couple of weeks but I didn't and then as time went on I thought I'm never going to wear this thing because it's got like straps for top so we just don't get enough hot weather in this country to justify um, knitting something with straps well maybe for some people it would work but for me I love to be covered up and cozy so so I decided I would adapt the pattern and it's the first time I've ever tried to do this um, so I'm basically knitting a yoke at the top instead of the straps so this is where I'm at so this is the um, this is the top see it there um, that's the back that's the front of it there so I've knit a round yoke a rounded yoke um, this is a block out I think it's a bit puckered at the moment with the the, the um, decreased stitches so I followed instructions for the proportions to get the proportions right in the yoke I followed the instructions for the number of decreases that you need to make and when you need to make them from uh, my Vogue knitting book which is I had it out here where did I put it so my book Vogue knitting um, this is a brilliant book it's just full of lots of um, instructions for uh, designing your own sweater, designing your own shawl and um, just information, everything you need to know about knitting. So I bought this a couple of years ago and uh, I haven't used it a lot but I found it really useful now when I'm trying to do something sort of without a pattern. So that's the first time I've tried to do this and I've been finding it really exciting to uh, to realize that oh yeah it's actually um straightforward enough uh once you sit down there's a bit of maths involved uh but for a simple yoked sweater it's not that difficult to, to to work out the decreases once you work out how many stitches you want for your neck how much how what your gauge is and what width of neck you want you work out how many stitches you need to get to and you know how many stitches you're starting off with because you're this is bottom up so you this uh trust new bottom up so once you have that difference in number of stitches and you know the depth that you want for your yoke um and you know your row gauge you can work out how many rows you're going to be knitting how many stitches you want to decrease um and then you can just divide it up so that they're they occur at regular intervals of roughly I've done them at two inch intervals as we go up and uh, yeah I'm at the the neck ribbing now so it's uh, just as well that I am at the neck ribbing because I'm literally down to very little wool um, what did I do with the other two bits that I had there yeah this is what I've got left so this is the wool I'm using and um, so we've got Life in the Long Grass. Uh, this is called Barn and it's a semi-solid um, colorway. And this is Storm. So uh, you can see that it is also a semi-solid colorway. And this one is um, Fiber Spades Vivacious Four Ply Maple Syrup is the name of that one. So these two are uh, a sport weight merino. This is actually a fingering weight. And because of the difference in the weights, I've been using a 3.75 millimeter needle for the vivacious four ply and a 3.5 for the sport weight for the life in the long grass. Um, yeah, so I'm just really loving the way these three colors, the effect they're giving when they're knit up and uh, in the stripe, I really adore the uh, the effect. Now the, um, so, I'm really at the end of, I only have one skein each of um, the red and the, the gold. Um, I have two more skeins of the, of the storm. So I'm going to do the sleeves. I'm actually not, I was thinking I might do a short sleeve version uh, of this, but I really love the idea of having uh, gray sleeves, the, the storm color in long sort of um, 
fairly fitted sleeves all the way down a bit like this jumper here where you have them you know really nice fitted long sleeves covering up to the knuckles um yeah so that's that that's how that's progressing um i also followed so i've done a sh section of short rows at the back of the neck and um in order to figure this out which i thought i'd never do uh figure out how to do short rows myself but um i followed a podcast called knitting the stash um and she forget her name i'm sorry but she was fantastic at just helping you figure out how to um how to do short rows without a pattern basically how to to figure out uh where you're going with short rows for giving extra fabric at the back of the neck of your sweater and when i listened to her it just made so much sense that it's also not that uh, difficult if you're working without a pattern so as you can see the rib is being done there in the um in the gold color so i'm going to have a gold color rib that's at the front so i don't have too much more to go and it's quite a wide neckline i really like the idea of a wide neckline um i have a few sweaters with high collars like this one um so i'm liking the idea of the, the lower wide scoops neckline and long fitted sleeves and this is quite actually it's quite fitted it's only got two inches of positive ease which is unusual for me as well so i'm liking the idea of something a bit more fitted and i've been trying this on regularly as i'm going especially to see how the shape of the yoke is, is going and how it's fitting me so i love the the shape on it it's really really nice um is there anything else i wanted to to let you know about that um i don't think so it's a really nice lovely drape beautiful wool um and i'm I, anything with stripes actually it's so nice to knit because you really see the progress and you want to get onto the next color and yeah it's nice i like it i like doing uh, anything this was beautiful to knit as well because of the as i was saying earlier the change in the uh the way the fabric is the way the colors are actually knitting up from the variegated wool and this is another way of keeping your interest going i'm finding my interest is waning a bit on the uh sort of solid color projects that i'm doing um but i know that i would probably really love the finished product you know on the solid colors like sometimes you're weighing up between really enjoying knitting something and will you actually wear it or how much how much you'll wear it um yeah so because with color work sometimes i think uh i probably wear them less than um the amount of joy i get out of knitting them is sort of probably more than i get out of wearing not always but sometimes so that's great progress made on that and i'd say by the next podcast i'll have the sleeves done on that and i might even be wearing it at that stage which would be cool um so the next thing i have to talk to you about um uh, the half and half triangles wrap is one of my finished objects it's from so i have two finished objects to show you today um the half and half wrap is one that i finished last year at uh, the end of the year and the the other project was also from 2021 but thought you might like to see them anyway so here we go this is my half and half wrap and it is knit in two different types of wool so you probably you may recognize this as the very bright and neon like color from uh, pearl soho's collection of linen quill so this is the pink flamingo a uh, bright flamingo i forget which what the name of the color is and it is um yeah it's just absolutely luscious so soft um this is a a shawl that has been made really famous um a lot of podcasters have a lot of knitters have been knitting it a lot of podcasters have been talking about it uh stacy elstone uh i love her podcasts she is uh, a lover of this design um a free pattern from pearl soho uh and uh she's got a lot of podcasts which talk about different color matching of the different 
the different colors of that um of that wool and um it's just such a relaxing project actually it's i know i remember people talking about this when i was looking at podcasts before i started doing my own and i couldn't um before i started knitting it i was thinking how can such a simple project give you um that amount of that amount of joy you know and uh, so but it's the rhythm of it it's the simplicity of it it's not having to think too hard and actually i think what's crucial is using the original wool that's meant for the pattern um i know that you can use any other wool that has a, has a similar drape and actually that's what i did with the other color in this and when i knit this i had ordered a um what i thought was going to be like a slate gray because i think slate gray goes really well with um yeah with uh with really bright neon pink so I ordered the Stillwater Blue from the Pearl Soho colorway, which is this color here. And actually on the screen here, it is coming up as a sort of a, as a slate gray, but in reality, there's an awful lot of blue in it. I mean, okay, the, the name Stillwater Blue is, gives that away, but I think it's just so hard. And I've spoken about this before. It's really, really hard to see, uh, to know what a color is going to look like. Um, if you're buying it online from a photograph and even as you can see this really doesn't doesn't show what it's like in reality so I, I bought I ordered this to go with the the pink and I actually just didn't like it I mean there they are together I just didn't like them together so um, and that's something I would have been able to see if I had been in a shop and could pick them up and compare them in natural light so instead I decided I wanted something navy to go with the pink and I looked around closer to home for an alternative and I found this wool here is called, it's, as you can see, it's got plenty of the, the white flecks, it's got linen in it as well. So the linen is white because it doesn't take up the, the dye in the same way as the, the mer it's merino in this case. Uh, so this is, I think, 80-20 merino uh, linen, I think. That's the proportions, but it's something similar. But there's no alpaca, so it's um, it just doesn't have the softness or the sort of uh, what's what's the word sort of um, the squishiness, I suppose. <laughs> it's the it this really fluffs up the uh, the linen quill. This is sort of more uh, thinner fabric, and um, it has the drape. It has the beautiful look. But it just doesn't have the softness so this is called kremka sole wool and it is what i really liked about it is that it's actually european and it, so it comes from germany but i think they source the wool from european sources uh, i think the linen is from belgium i think belgium has a big linen industry and the merino i think is from eastern europe i can't remember which country i'm sorry um i can put it in the show notes below all of the all of the projects that I'm talking about on the podcast will be, um, the details are in the, the show notes, in the description, sorry, in the description below. Yeah, so, and if there's anything you want to ask me about any of the projects, leave a comment. Um, you know, uh, I answer all the comments. Um, I love to get them. And uh, yeah, it's great to have that conversation with people about, um, you know, other people's experience of the same pattern or the same wool um you know it's such a it's such a brilliant community it's great to feel part of that conversation so yeah just leave a comment if you have ever used either of these before um uh, if you have any questions about them um so yeah that was that's my my uh half and half wrap um i used so i was looking at the wrong side of it there the right side of it you can see the lovely effects of the german short rows so you can see that they are, um, there we go. So it's a beautiful seam that's given by the, uh, the German short rows are not in the pattern. Um, I think it was Caddy Jacksnitz who, who put out a video suggesting that it's a nice, maybe me easier, nicer way than the, I think it's wrap and turns that are done in the, uh, that is, that are in the actual original pattern so the german short rows give a lovely a lovely join but you can use whichever one you want uh it doesn't really matter 
Um, yeah, so ever since I've been, I mean, this took a long time, like it just goes on forever, you know, uh, it's, but because of that, it's also really relaxing. It's really nice. But I um, have since then always wanted to knit another one. And I thought to myself, if I ever knit this again, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use linen quill for, for both triangles, um, you know, because I really was a little bit disappointed, but I mean, not completely. I do love it. Uh, we do. I mean, this gets used, so it's a wrap, but we use it actually as a blanket in our house. And um, yeah, Ruben loves it. It's just something we have on the couch or on the bed. And especially the pink side is the really, really cozy, warm side. So um, so I'm going to do another one and I'm going to do a uh, I'm going to do both sides in linen quill. Um, so I'll show you what colors I've got. So um, I ordered these online recently and they were it's very exciting when they arrived. So as you can see, um, my color palette is greens. Um, uh, I just love green. Um, greens, browns, actually autumnal colors I love. So this is uh, fresh pickle. As you can see, there's a load of uh, lovely white flecks in it and um, fresh pickle, uh, juniper green which actually looks really nice in reality. So when I was ordering this, I wasn't sure about it, but I did see that uh, Inga of Knitting Traditions had knit a half and half wrap with this as one color and with a, a sort of a gray, a light white gray as the contrast color. Uh, so this is called Wheat Flower. And uh, so my thinking is to do, I know I've got three colors here and the wrap is two. So I'm thinking of doing these two colors together. Um, absolutely adore them. But uh, Linen, or Pearl Soho actually recommend, this is one of their recommendations, is these two, the Fresh Pickle and the Juniper Green. So I got two colors just to choose. I'm not sure which ones I'm gonna do. And if I, whatever I don't choose in the wrap, I will make something else out of. Uh, I could make a, a camisole top or I could do it's three skeins so it's not quite a jumper's weight uh, or jumper quantity for me but um, yeah there they are aren't they absolutely gorgeous it's really really beautiful beautiful stuff beautiful wool um, I mean it's expensive to order it because of the because of the VAT, we have to pay 23% on top of the price but there was a 25% off sale so I reckoned they sort of cancel each other out so it's sort of like getting them at full price if you're living in the states uh, and the shipping is re really reasonable actually um i think it was 17 dollars for the shipping so not too bad considering it has to come so far so they're really nice uh, i'm very much looking forward to knitting the next linen the next uh, half and half wrap uh, but i have a lot on the go who knows when i'll do it um, and this time of the year is really busy for me with my work so uh but there's always christmas coming gosh not too far away now um so i think this is the next thing i wanted to show you um the gold wing by jennifer steingas is my other finished object from 2021 from i think it was august that i finished this so this is and I washed these, these recently. This is, I wear this all the, quite a lot, not all the time, but in the winter time, uh, I wear it. And um, I washed it recently because we had lovely sunny weather and I knew it was gonna be easy to get it dry. And uh, there we go. That's the sleeve detail. And the white wool has come up really bright and clean and shiny it had got a little bit sort of um uh yeah it just looks a little bit dirty um because i was wearing it so much and i'm really thrilled with i don't wash my woolens that often you don't need to but um yeah it was great to see it coming up so nicely again and this dried in no time because the wool is so light so it's a pattern by jennifer steingas um it actually calls for worsted weight wool and uh, I used uh, Plutolope 
Icelandic unspun wool held in a single strand, which actually is equivalent to DK. So again, there's this issue with me that I'm not getting gauge when I use worsted weight uh, in patterns that call for it. And I have to go right down to, I mean, I suppose I could change the needle size, but actually then it just becomes very, um, uh, the fabric becomes very heavy and uh, dense, I think. When, that, when I do that, if I change the needle size, um, I was going to show you, this is the, this is a plate of the wool that I used in that sweater. And it is um, not showing up as nicely as it is in reality. There's so many different colors in this. There's lots of sort of uh, ready browns and greens and um, light browns. Uh, it's just such a lovely um, blend of uh, autumnal colors really. It's called Dark Woods. So this is from Istex, Istex Plutilope. Um, and as you can see, it is the, the unspun wool. So it's got lots of loftiness and airiness to it. And, uh, and of course it breaks really easy if you put it that way. But when I'm knitting with it, I mean, it does break very, very easily. But I know lots of people have talked about the difficulties or there's a perception maybe that it's difficult to knit with and perhaps for some people who who are using a different technique but certainly for um english style knitting i found it doesn't break at all when i'm using it and i find it's an easy uh it's an easy uh yarn to knit with you know it's nice yeah so the other color then is uh, i think it's called white just simply white or it's natural a natural color um and um sort of looks like a cappuccino <laughs> that's what i call this my cappuccino jumper um because you've got this gorgeous white uh, top and a brown brown main color and the pattern is just absolutely stunning <laughs> jennifer steingas is so talented and what's brilliant about her patterns is that they're actually really simple there's there's no there's they're very very easy to knit um i did knit another one of her patterns which uh, i've just given the jumper to a friend because it, the color suits her a lot better and for me it's uh it was quite a pale i think it was called uh, oatmeal oatmeal was the main color in that one um and it was the bright feather the bright feather pattern by uh, jennifer steingas so i knit two of them i mean in really quick time these took me about maybe two weeks to knit or something they're just so fast and uh, and the other thing then about this using the Plutilope is that it's such a lightweight sweater so it's lightweight it's warm it looks great it's comfortable it doesn't cost anything to knit I mean that the wool is so so inexpensive compared to linen, the likes of linen quill or even this type of variegated hand dyed yarn um, I mean this stuff is just so affordable uh, so if you're looking for affordability and a beautiful wool as well something that creates a gorgeous sweater uh, you really can't go wrong with um, with Icelandic wool um, yeah so that's that um, what else was I going to talk to you about let me see um, Yes, yeah, so I actually bought more of that. As you can see, I have, I think I have about six plates of this. So this is 100 grams and it's 300 meters. So if you're holding it double, you get 150 meters per um, 200 grams, is that right? Uh, and you need, so if you're, if you're holding this single, you just get a lot of value for your money. Um, and I'm thinking of using I think I have six plates of this, which gives me three sixes or 18, 1800 meters, which actually is enough for um, a pattern that I was talking about knitting in the last episode of my podcast. And that is the um, beautiful Widow's Kiss. And I had a swatch to show you of that. If I can find it, no, it's gone many things here beside me I keep track so let's see that is the, the pattern widow's kiss and I would really like if any of you viewers out there in 
YouTube worlds have any idea of uh, or have experienced knitting this pattern because I was really excited to start it and I actually had cast on uh, for what would be my normally be my size which I think is about a size four uh, with this pattern to get the recommended ease and I was I had so many stitches on the needles and I was thinking like it was working out that it was going to be 68 inches or something crazy like my bust size is uh, 41 inch bust and so with the ease recommended of what were they recommending for the ease let's see five inches so that would make have made mine a 46 which is actually a size five so 46 inch bust so I was going to have to, and I know that, so I was, you start to bottom up, which actually I was surprised about because uh, bottom up sweaters are not my favourite to knit. Um, but anyway, I was going to go with it and follow the pattern. And I've done one of Thea Coleman's patterns before, as I was saying, I did the, uh, what's it called, the peated whiskey from, from my niece, a cabled cardigan. And I didn't have a problem with that. Um, but this one is so it starts bottom up so you're doing I think a one by one rib and then you're moving into this really detailed uh, cable pattern and I know that the cable pattern is going to bring the fabric in um, and that's why you're starting off with a large number of stitches but I just thought six to go from 68 inches at the rib at the hem to 46 at the bust was going to be like 22 inches I just thought, how can that be, how can that work? Um, so I was a bit exhausted anyway, trying to figure it out. And I really didn't want to continue knitting um, knitting it. I will give it another go at some stage because I absolutely love the pattern, but I'd be really grateful if any of you guys have tried it out, if any of you have knit that pattern before and what your experience of it has been. And um, yeah, uh, should I be going with a smaller size? Um, I don't know, maybe my gauge wasn't right. Uh, I've had real trouble with the gauge on this one. Sometimes gauge just works, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's sort of a mystery sometimes, isn't it? It's one of the joys of knitting, just not knowing what's gonna happen. <laughs> so, although we do try and control as much as possible what's happening, so as not to be disappointed. But uh, anyway, that's Jennifer Steingast with, a, with his kiss. So what I was saying to you there was that I actually did a swatch up using the Plutalopi held single. So even though this is a worsted sweater, it actually looks beautiful. I did a cable, I did I did a swatch in the cable uh, pattern, uh, which I've mislaid here now, but uh, it really looks stunning. The um, the loftiness of that wool, um, it's gonna be a really lightweight sweater. Uh, and I know that the design is intended for a yarn that has it's actually got um, Icelandic wool in it. So she's got a mixture. I mean, it sounds like a beautiful yarn, the one she's using. It's Sawkill Farm Two Ply Worsted, uh, which c contains Romney, Finn, Icelandic and Gotland fibre. Oh my God, they're my favorite. Well, certainly Icelandic and Gotland are my favorite fibres. Um, Romney and Finn, I haven't used or come across, but really rustic wools anyway. It's fabulous. That sounds like a really nice yarn, a fabulous blend. So I know that the Icelandic wool on its own will definitely give the same effect that was intended by the designer when she was designing it. So uh, yeah, I'll definitely do it at some stage, but gosh, I was very put off by that first experience of the number of stitches I had on the needle um, in the one by one rib and that translating to from 68 inches to 46. I couldn't figure out how that was gonna happen. Um, so yeah, I suppose by doing the swatch, I was trying to see what is the gauge, how many stitches should I have actually, uh, you know, when I am um, in order to get 46 inches in that stitch pattern. Otherwise it's a bit of a mystery and an unknown. Um, and that's the only way I'm gonna figure it out. Um, but it's very hard to measure a gauge swatch in a cable. Uh, I really need to do it again. I didn't have enough. I only did a small swatch but definitely your advice would be very welcome if you have any for me. Um, so plans for the future, so that's one of them, uh, this, the Widow's Kiss, and the other one I'm gonna do is, um, which I just agreed with Ruben last night, I asked him what sweater he'd like this winter, 
because uh, he's growing all the time and the one he has the storm word that I knit for him earlier on this year thankfully still fits him because I made it quite big um, but he's just growing so tall um, he's not too broad shouldered at the moment which is good but I'd say in the next year or two he's, uh, he's going to need uh, he's going to keep growing anyway um, so I uh, we sat down and we had a look at uh, ones I had favourited on Ravelry and which I thought he might like and I have lots of uh, let lopey and I thought the sweater that he has the Stormore sweater is knit in let lopey and he really loves it I mean he just picks that up all the time and you can see why it's just so cozy um, and he sort of said oh just do the same <laughs> the same pattern again mum and I thought no, <laughs> I can't. I hate doing the same pattern again. It's just like really tedious, I think, re-knitting. I know lots of people do, um, particularly the ranunculus, lots of people knit the same pattern over again twice or three times or five or six times. Uh, and I suppose I am doing it with the with the uh, half and half wrap, but I just couldn't knit the same sweater again. So I said to him, um, choose another one. So we came up with uh, a sweater called the Winter Fox. So it's a beautiful name. And it's by Anna Sophie, Sophia Wintersall. Um, all of this information will be in the, um, in the description below. And I'm going to be using Let Lopi for it. Uh, so the pattern, uh, I'll put a picture up here, but it's got lovely paw prints across the yoke. Uh, and that's the color work. And the rest of it is plain and I'll show you the colours. So I actually have most of the, the colours because I ordered a load of Let Lopi, uh, I think was it last year? Um, yeah, just to have, because I just thought I love this so much, I know I'm going to use it. Um, and so these are the colours. And they are, um, this is Acorn Heather, and it's number 53 in the Let Lopi closer to the screen. It's a beautiful dark brown colour. Um, bit. And then Oatmeal Heather, actually that's number 85 so it's not the same exact colour that is used in the pattern. I think she uses a uh, number 86 or my, maybe I've got those mixed up. She uses the light beige Heather which is either 86 or 85. This is either 86 or 85. Um, yeah. And then this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, rust heather. So the number for that is um, 9427 is the rust heather. So the let lopi is just absolutely beautiful wool. It's stunning. That's it there. It's a worsted weight or iron weight wool. So there's 50 grams to 100 meters is 50 grams. So I have plenty of I got a sweater quantity for myself actually of this brown colour, uh, the acorn heather. And since then I haven't really been motivated to, to knit in that colour for myself, but Ruben really likes it. So it's going to be a nice sweater. So uh, that is that. Um, yeah. So um, that's it for finished objects. And I um, have already talked really about my acquisitions. They were, that was the, the beautiful linen quill that I got uh, in the post the other day. Actually, it just arrived recently. It's so exciting to get wool in the post, it really is. So, um, yeah. Um, oh, I meant to tell you, actually, I had this here for a reason. I meant to say to you that this is the amount that I have left over from uh, life, my life in the long grass from this sweater. So I bought five skeins and I think I knit a size four. I couldn't find my notes. I really am going to have to update my Ravelry more regularly so that I have notes for myself there. And um, because I've moved on to several different notebooks uh, since I knit this, uh, since I started it, started it in March. And I since, since March, I have completed one notebook and I've moved on to another. So this is in a previous one and I can't find it. I'm sure it's somewhere in the house, but Anyhow, what I was going to say about this is that it is 80 grams left of a 100 gram, a 100 gram skein. So a load of that left. Um, I'm going to have to come up with some idea for freezing that beautiful, beautiful wool. Um, but just to let you know, that's how much I used. Um, and this is the 
lovely uh, Life in the Long Grass storm. So this is a gorgeous, I mean, you can't see this at all actually, but it's got red in it. It's almost like a purple. Uh, and some, I've shown it to somebody and they said, oh, that's a lovely purple, you know, and it's just, you wouldn't know by looking at it on the screen here. Um, give you an idea, maybe you can start to see it there. So this is the Life Hand Dyed uh, in West Cork, Life in the Long Grass, and this is gonna be uh, the sleeves to my, um, my adaptation of Albina McLaughlin's Trasnu. So I'm doing the yoke and the sleeves. Um, I think that's it. Um, I was going to do a question and answer section at the end here just to get your thoughts on, um, you know, one aspect of knitting. And I mean, I talk, everybody loves yarn and it's really one of the big motivators for me to knit because there's such a variety of, of yarns out there now. And I suppose I'd like to know a little bit more about what type of yarn you use you know what um what's your favorite yarn what makes you choose a certain type of yarn i mean there i know everybody has so many different reasons for choosing different ones whether it be obviously you want the right uh fiber content for to suit the pattern that you're using um maybe you're interested in where the yarn is coming from or the method of production that's used and um the weight of it the drape of it the uh, whatever I mean, there's so many criteria when we're choosing the color that's a big thing does which does any one of these things for you override any other aspect when you're choosing yarn or when you're you know I mean really just from what I've been talking about there I've been really um, so taken with Linen Quill that even though it sort of in a way goes against my principles to be ordering yarn from so far away so we've got the air miles, you know, we've got even the source of that yarn, South America is so far away, even from North America, and then so far away from Europe. Um, so, you know, there's so many stages in the production that mean that there's air miles involved. Um, but I can't help myself. I just love it. So just wondering, is there any sort of criteria that you use to that overrides another in terms of choosing, choosing your yarn? Um, yeah so uh that's it uh please you leave your comments below i'd love to hear from you and i'd love to find out about more different yarns that i don't know about um whether they be yarns that are wherever they are available in the world um you know obviously european yarns are easier for me to get and they cost less in terms of um you know i don't have to pay customs or vat or um, shipping no vat anyway unfortunately with the UK now after Brexit we're really in a, a, a bad way in this country in terms of getting stuff from the UK it used to be sort of the main market for for me anyway for looking for for yarn um, I do know that they're bringing in a change that visitors can now visitors to the UK will be eligible to not pay vat on goods so I mean I think that's sort of that's a help, but still ordering online it doesn't help. Really, you know, we're sort of stuck. Um, I still do order stuff from the UK, and I um, I pay the I pay the charges, but it's sort of not great. Um, yeah, uh, maybe just let me know what wool you use or what yarn you use. I use the word wool all the time. Sorry, instead of yarn because it's just something I grew up with. <laughs> yarn is so new to me. Um, uh, and technically speaking it's wool is sort of inaccurate because you can have loads of different fibers but anyway wool whatever it's called so um yeah that's it leave your comments below and uh yeah the other thing i suppose I, i'm going to start talking a little bit about uh wild plants and irish and ancient ancient irish and celtic traditions and customs so if you want to uh switch off now that's great thank you very much for watching the knitting content and um please like and subscribe if you like this video and i'd really love to hear from you and um i'm going to leave some footage at the end of uh blackberries me picking some blackberries close to my house so if you're interested in hanging on for that section um that's uh, that's what you have in store Okay, 
thanks very much for listening and we move on to my wild plant section so um yeah blackberries so i have picked a stem of blackberries for you to see uh what they look like when they're growing on the bushes everybody from this part of the world is very familiar with these so this is what they look like um this is a fabulous look how how dark they are when they ripen so the red berries are the unripened berries and the black ones obviously are the really ripe uh, juicy sweet blackberries you can see some of them have gone they are uh, sort of shriveled up a bit here um, where is it just here and that's because we're sort of reaching the, the end of the season when the blackberries are good um, but that just gives you an idea of how beautiful they look when they're on the stem and you can see that very very thorny stem um, yeah so that's that's what we're talking about it's easier to see it back here isn't it sorry yeah you get a good impression of how beautiful the whole thing is i mean i just think they're lovely on on the actual plant because you've got a mix of the green the red and the black the beautiful colors um and it just is a picture of autumn really for me this this blackberry um blackberry stem and then when they're picked and they're in the bowl they look delicious like this so there we go I just picked these this morning so there's still a load of them on on the bushes even though we're now the 25th of September um, uh, they are good up until depending on the tradition some some traditions say that they're good up until the end of October and others say the 29th of September or Michaelmas so 29th of, 9th of September is next week and actually I would say that they are uh, nearing the end of uh, being really really good as you can see on that branch some of them are shriveled up um, and you can see some, sometimes there is mildew some of them are rotting from the rain because uh, I mean the, I think we have a really good crop this year because of the the sunshine we've had lots of heat and lots of sunshine and the rain has started to come back again thankfully it's a good thing um so but the blackberries are affected by the moisture from the rain so um yeah in some areas it was considered the 29th september that you wouldn't you shouldn't eat blackberries after that and in other places it's after uh it's Samhain, it's the t uh, 31st of october which is the beginning of the new year in the celtic calendar um after sow and after the 31st you just don't eat them at all definitely i mean there probably aren't that many left on the bushes at that stage but um yeah so the word there was a tradition uh i mean tradition in this same traditions actually are similar ones all over the british isles so all over scotland england wales and ireland you know they they're similar sort of uh folklore and uh traditions around blackberries um, and when to eat them and when not to um, and in Ireland particularly it was the work of a fairy called the Puka who uh, uh, the tradition had it spat on the berries um, by this time of the year by the end of certainly by the end of October and so really in a way it looks like it because you've got especially with mildew on them they just look so unappetizing and uh, yeah so you can imagine the fairy the Puka spitting on the blackberries so that was the tradition in other traditions it was the devil that had uh, spread his cloak over the blackberry bush uh, and caused them to rot uh, so this is a lovely uh, sense of a tradition of some evil sort of force uh, causing the the wonderful fruit of the blackberry to to just be inedible um yeah there are other traditions associated with it so basically it is known it's used as a dye the um not the blackberries themselves but the root of the blackberry bush was used as, as a dye for um coloring yarn so this was something in my previous podcast that we had with um i forget now which which uh, plant i was talking about um the last one i was talking about they there would have been um it was used as a yellow dye and so all of these wild plants and their roots 
uh, can be used, I think, in some way or other to to dye wool. And apparently, from the blackberry bush, from the root of the blackberry, you were able to get a um, either a dark green dye or an orange dye when it was used mixed with other other plants. So um, also the the, the blackberry um, a stalk or branch is really strong and it was used for helping to secure thatching to secure the roof of a thatched house and was also used in wicker work so for making baskets or containers um, it's known as well to have been used as a, uh, a cure uh, for certain ailments and one of those ailments is the whooping cough and in England apparently um, so there's a thing that you can get which is an arch of a bramble so where the uh, the stem of the bramble plant comes out of the ground and then it they, they sort of hang over and they come right down into the ground forming an arch and they sort of re-plant re, um, themselves in the ground um, so you have this arch of bramble and this was th thought to have magical powers um, and it was considered to be curative uh, if you particularly for children who were made to pass underneath this bramble arch either three or nine times or seven times these are all really magical numbers uh, as well that if you pass through this number of times at a certain hour of the day in the morning for nine days in a row that uh, it was a cure for the whooping cough um, yeah so it's and there are other traditions around the the art the bramble arch uh, and the powers that it had so particularly in England it seems not so much in Ireland I haven't heard of this tradition before and I get all of this information I'm getting from the book that I was talking to you about in the last couple of videos and that's this fantastic Ireland's wild plants by Neil McCutcher and he talks about uh, the myths, legends and folklores, so folklore associated with the plants. And it's just absolutely fascinating to read. It's, this is a recent publication, it's 2019. So you can see there's just a rising interest in all of, um, I suppose, this ancient wisdom that we've just forgotten about. And um, the, other, um, the other author that I'm using is Diana Beresford Kruger in her book, To Speak for the Trees, where she talks about um, she talks about uh, wild plants, uh, trees particularly, but she goes, she goes into detail about the Irish, ancient Irish Ohm script, the Ohm uh, alphabet, and each letter in that alphabet represented a tree, and, or a plant or a bush. And this was the same with the blackberry. So the blackberry represents the letter M from where, M-U-I-R, and uh, interestingly, her name, she says even her name is associated with blackberries. So Beresford um, is the the the, the Dúna Smeirach in Irish. Dúna is a fort. Smeirach, Smeirach are is the Irish word for um, for berries. So uh, yeah, Dúna Smeirach, the, the the fort of the blackberries was the place that is associated with her ancestors. And uh, yeah, so it's just blackberries were ubiqu are still ubiquitous and we've been eating them for thousands of years. They found blackberry seeds in uh, archaeological excavations of Neolithic sites in the uh, human in remains of um, the stomach of, uh, um, I suppose, uh, burials of, of, of human burials from the Stone Age. So thousands and thousands of years we've been eating blackberries and benefiting from them. And Diana Beresford Kruger, who is a botanist herself and a scientist, um, you know, really is makes the point that actually modern science is only just beginning to understand the benefits of wild food for us and that they, they do contain um, properties which are immune boosting and um, they contain phytochemicals which are just essential for health uh, and that actually, you know, this is sort of something that's that's known instinctively to um, uh, indigenous cultures uh, who call eating from bushes, like eating bush food, uh, that, that they know that their, their people are uh, healthier um, when they're eating this type of food. So it's just such a privilege really to, to still have this, you know, in this, this, the world that we live in where it can be quite overwhelming to listen to this, um, news of uh, climate change and um, the effect that it's having on us that 
luckily and hopefully we can continue to to benefit that we have these um these foods that just grow naturally and are often seen even today in this country are seen as weeds and uh, ground to be cleared and we've certainly forgotten our ancient tradition of the Brehan laws so the Brehan laws were um laws ancient irish laws which um gave great uh, weight to the uh, importance and sacredness really of of wild plants and trees and um so the the blackberry was was considered uh it was a um a valuable sacred plant at the time by the brehan laws and they um if you were to clear a field full of blackberry bushes then you would have been given a fine again of a year old calf um um and uh yeah so it's just it, it they were considered sacred and because of their their healing powers and the the food that they gave um and obviously what we would say now their importance in biodiversity in feeding you know the, the food chain the survival of birds and insects and uh, pollinators and um the whole great sort of um yeah the whole web of of existence really um yeah and there are other stories ancient stories of uh in the eighth century so this is written stuff that's been written down that that in in our ancient folklore um an, uh, a hermit from the eighth century it's a poem an eighth century poem the hermit marbon speaks of his simple life in the woods and describes the manes of bramble with good blackberries that help to sustain him so that's an eighth century reference that's written down to the importance of blackberries and um, the fianna who are the ancient warriors of ireland describe how they feasted on beautiful blackberries um, and the tender twigs of the bramble bush so even the twigs of the bramble uh, when they were when they're when they're young um, are favored by uh, by children apparently you know in ancient times they were sweet to eat and um, provide a great curative properties um, in Scotland in particular they associate or they, the ancient traditions associate uh, bramble with a, as a cure for um, for skin conditions so burns or scalds or any rashes um, that the leaves provide um, a, a cure for that and actually it's, so it's uh, yeah it's so it's all parts of the plant as usual leaves um, fruit and branches um yeah so that's pretty much everything i think i can give you today about the blackberry um it is uh i mean it's, it's just still tradition here to to pick them at this time of the year and but we mainly we eat them off the bushes of course but we also make jam out of them and we make uh, either blackberry crumble or blackberry tarts or so we make uh, desserts out of them and um, blackberry crumble is the favorite in our house and we mix the blackberries with apples and just spread crumble over the top and put that in the oven and uh, yeah it's gorgeous and you really do feel good after eating them you feel really you know just um, just healthy I suppose when, when, when you eat them they're, they're, they're a great um, they're a great source of well immune boosting and it's a great time of the year as well it's a perfect time of the year to ha- to be eating immune boosting food uh, and on the, when winter is approaching um yeah so i think that's pretty much all there is to say and um it's been really nice talking to you again today uh, thank you so much for listening i hope you've enjoyed this content and i hope you leave a like and su- subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already um we're moving at this time of the year we're moving into sweater weather it's really nice to be moving into the autumn i hope everybody's enjoying that i hope you're all enjoying knitting and making making for the the colder weather if you're in the northern hemisphere if you're in the southern hemisphere and um, maybe you're moving into the the lightweight tops but uh and uh, the lightweight fab or the lightweight wools um or yarns so just thank you so much for for being here and um it's just a pleasure as always to be with you and uh, yeah i really look forward to seeing you again 
um, in the next podcast and enjoy the footage at the end of this video of some blackberry picking okay thanks very much everybody see you in the next episode bye for now Don't be a stranger in the night Take a chance for some romance Don't cover your eyes We'll love trees Know you better than anyone else It's time you let your guard down For someone like me Say I'm settled and pretty calm. I don't storm in the storm. If not me, then someone like me that knows what to do and how to take care of you. But most of all, that deserves you. You stand beside me in every dream Angel goddess, you cover them all Say, what can I do to get you to fall? For someone like me deserves you go with someone like